this computer. Oh, now the voice. Oh, here comes Nancy. So <laughs> good evening, Nancy. Hello. We're recording. Hi, Nancy. Hi. So we're recording right now, and, and I'm just going to get started up here. Um, I was thinking today how I, I had a, another idea of how I wish to end this to talk about Zion Lutheran Church at um, 4th and Cherry Streets. Um, it seated 2,500 people very comfortably. And this Lutheran Church hosted the Congressional Memorial Service for President George Washington in December of 1799. And I have about a 40 five minute presentation of what I've learned about Zion with all images and everything. But I need to actually clear some of these images uh, with the libraries that own them and I need to get a clearance and I thought I will abide by that. And so I'll make this offering special sometime in the fall. You know, I'll just say, why don't you log on and I'll talk to you about Zion Lutheran Church. So I decided to conclude on a, an interesting note uh, about what I learned about Erfurt as I was preparing this course. And then to talk about Luther and to wrap it all up as to what was important and what I learned and how Luther dealt with difficult times. I felt it was important to end on a devotional note um, because Luther, Luther taught me a few things. Um, and so I thought I would do it that way. So let me now start pulling up my little, my little um, PowerPoints and I need to just shrink this down. And let's see, I am going to go to slideshow and from the beginning. And there we are. So now I've got that. So, but now I need to share screen. So let me move over here. And here's my share screen. Um, yes, there it is. There's my shared screen. So let's see what we are doing. Uh, slideshow from beginning. So you all see this term BID, W A I D, on your screen? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Um, one of the things I learned in 215 when I did the Luther tour is uh, we were in Airport and I learned about VID. And VIDE is very important for the University of Erfurt and for the city of Erfurt. So let's, let's step back and talk about Erfurt. This is a skyline of Erfurt that I've shown before. This was in the 1493 History of the World that Koberger published. And this is an accurate representation of the skyline in Erfurt. You will see St. Mary's and Severin's on the hill there, these two, two important churches. And this is the skyline. And so Erfurt was a very prominent city, so much so that in 1493, Koberger put this accurate skyline in his book because he wanted to sell, he wanted to sell copies in Erfurt because Erfurt was a rich city and it had a university. And universities were usually the result of a donation uh, from a, um, a member of the nobility or from the crown, from the king or queen. But Erfurt does not have a, a king or queen. It does. It has its merchant class. And so here we are, and this is the iconic moment on the hill in Erfurt. And on the left-hand side, you see the church where Luther was ordained to the priesthood. This was an important church in his moment. And on just uh, all across the plaza is St. Severin's. So Erfurt is a very pious, a very, a very, a very religious city. A very, this is an important part of their 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 life. Um, Erfurt had 20,000 people living in it when Luther was there. This is the city in which Luther lived that had the largest population. Um, so this is 20,000 people. 700 of those people were in were clergy. So this was a city that had a number of churches with a, a number of clergy that were serving them. So this is this is Erfurt. But you can see from these buildings, these are these are very uh, prestigious, very, very prestigious buildings. And this is what Erfurt looks like today after reunification and restoration. Erfurt was a very important trading center. And this is what homes look like uh, that have been restored. Um, so you can tell by the color and, and everything of the paintings and the walls. This is a city that had money and it had, it had uh, influence. So 
1392, they opened the doors to a university, and this is where Luther will come in 1502. But the question that was always there is, how does Air Force get a, a, a university? Um, because it takes money. And Air Force had the money from its merchant class because of Vide. So let me talk to you about Vide. You're looking at it right now. Um, it's those yellow bushes, these yellow bushes that are sprouting up all over the place. And it is called Vide. Vide is a native of the um, Egypt. And when the Romans came in and took over Egypt, they naturally found this Vide and they started moving it around, seeing if it would grow in other places. Um, and so eventually it made its way to the Rhineland and eventually it came to Erfurt. And so they would plant these bushes of vide. And once it, they would plant it in crops, it was a crop. And when it reached the second year of maturity, it could be harvested. So they would harvest this vide. And this vide headed to a place like this in Erfurt, where you had this wheel. And they would throw the branches of the bush. They would throw the branches of the bush on, underneath this wheel, this grinding wheel that um, people or a mule would just roll around and it would crush this vide, this, this bush, so that it would eventually ferment. It would actually ferment. And what you ended up with, oh, here's a close up of the wheel. Um, it's actually very interesting. You're crushing these leaves and the branches and the stalks. You're crushing okay. them, you're making okay. them pulp. And what you're going to eventually do, what you're eventually going to do is you're going to then eventually let it ferment and you're going to store it. And when you do that, you come up with this, these fibrous, fibrous clusters that, um, and the color you're looking at is what vide will eventually turn into. It creates this very rich blue dye. And this is how the city of Erfurt was the perfect climate for the growing of vide in Central Europe and Erfurt made its money on vide. So you would actually, they had actually storehouses where you put this vide, these fibrous, these fibrous clusters, and you would store them until they were needed. And so Airfort, and you will see now shops that have started to redo this process of this, this ancient medieval process of creating this blue dye, which would then made Airfort famous and brought a great deal of money to the city. So this is what it looks like, Airfort's Blauwes Wunder vide. So Airfort's blue wonder and vide is, is what it's all about, this blue dye that it would create and they could dye, dye cloth. So this is one of the dyeing houses. This is, and you can see from this, that this family is not poor. This family is exceeded, this or is an, an important organization. They're generating a great deal of money. And this is what one of these dyeing houses looked like. Now to make, once you wanted to dye a batch of cloth in, in, into, into it, you wanted to dye cloth to make it blue and you used the vide, you needed ammonia. And ammonia was available in one thing that they learned about very early and that was urine. So they would not ask for it from women, they asked for it from men. They would ask them you know, to donate a pint um, and so, and it was the ammonia in the urine when it mixed, and I'll explain how this goes, that, that it, this all came together to create this wonderful blue dye that they could, you know, yards and yards and yards of this blue, blue fabric that was absolutely perfect. And it funded the, the city of Erfurt and allowed them to establish the university. So you notice on the dye house here, here's the dye house, there it is. And you notice the main, the main doorway there, there are these two holes, one on either side. And this is how they advertised how they needed, how they needed um, some, some urine. So if you are in early modern Europe and you're looking for how, how can we get urine? Well, you just serve them beer. So that was the secret here in Erfurt. These, are, these houses would do this and how they did it to advertise is they would put this in those openings, which are the hops. And it was sort of an advertisement like, come drink a pint and leave a pint and we can make, we can make, we can make this fabric, this blue dye, which is fantastic. And so once they had this ammonia and they would put the, the fibrous, these fibrous clusters in that, in that solution, they would then, then 
immerse the cloth in there. They would pull it out. It's bright yellow. They would hang it on lines. Literally, these fields, they were, they were the drying fields. And what happens is as it oxidizes, with, when the air hits it, it starts to oxidize. And you've got this absolutely stunning blue cloth, this stunning blue cloth that just made Airfort so popular. And as of reunification, you can now walk down the streets of Airfort and they have re resurrected this old process of how they made blue cloth. And so I found this intriguing. You know, when, when I see these things, it's like, now that's something I didn't know. That's something I wanted, to, I want to learn. I'm glad I learned it. And I'm very grateful for the people who showed me how this worked and all of this. And then here we are, how they manage this. And I thought, wow, now there's something that's, you know, how did Air Fort make its money? Well, it made its money on blue cloth. And they created this blue cloth, thanks to Vide, which the Romans introduced to their provinces in Germany. And then it transferred itself to Air Fort. And Air Fort was absolutely blessed with the perfect weather conditions. And so thank you for allowing me to share with you the story of Vide and Air Fort. If you ever get to Air Fort, please look at these shops that have resurrected this process. It's a wonderful, beautiful cloth, a beautiful blue. So that aside, that aside, all right, that's aside. Um, that's aside, that's where I'm at. And so I just thought, okay, I learned that. I was astonished and I thought, you know, and I told my, I talked to it with my students, you know, this is how Air Force made its money. And that's something which brings life into who we are. And, and I, I appreciated that. So now we'll turn to Luther. And uh, let's see, now I've got to go right. Let's see here. Um, Let's do it this way. And then I'm going to share screen, but I have to move things around on the screen of my computer. Thank you for bearing with me. There is my screen right there. I'm going to share it. And it's going to be sort of a review of what we have done over the last few, few weeks. And there'll be some new things here. And then I'm gonna conclude it on a devotional note. All right, where are we? There we go, from beginning. So this was the, the seal I started with. This presentation has been approved for curious audiences by an independent lab in Paoli. The following presentation has been rated R, religious. Um, this, there may be some disturbing elements in the presentation because history is never neat and tidy. So here we are. So dealing with a timeout, Luther in Castle Coburg. And this goes back to last week when I talked about the Augsburg Confession, the document that all Lutherans hover around. This is what we all agree on. This is our core. This is our heart. And Luther wasn't there when it was, he was in the pre, in the preparation of it. But when it actually came to, to creating it, Melanchthon was on his own because he couldn't cross the border. And when I read this about what Luther was doing in Castle Coburg, I thought, now this is something I can incorporate into my life because it gives me comfort when I'm stressed. So, Here's, here's Luther's life. You're looking at St. Mary's Church and my, my the students that went through Lutheran's confessions with me knew the silhouette of this church. This is where Luther was appointed to be priest, pastor. He heard confession, he taught, he preached. And these are some of the lectures. He did Psalms, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. So he, he loved this. And in 1514, he comes to the city church. We know through these sessions that we've had together, as we've been together on these Wednesday evenings, that there was this hiccup, and that was when he saw this, when the indulgence was released by um, Albert or Albrecht, Archbishop of Mainz and Magdeburg, that promised forgiveness of your sins and um, forgiveness of, for, of sins for your, for your, for your de deceased members of the family. Indulgences never gave you forgiveness of sin. That was the position of the church. It was always through the Christ on the cross. Um, the indulgence was to help you with your penance, you know, make a donation to a poor person. And so they issued these indulgences. And this is what upset him. And Tetzel was the seller of these indulgences. 
He could not enter electoral Saxony, that was forbidden, but he came close to the villages on the border and Luther's parishioners ran across the border to buy these indulgences. And so, you know, the sale and purchase of paradise was what this was about. And Luther had an objection to this particular indulgence. So he's in Wittenberg, the red is electoral Saxony. His elector had supreme power. He was one of seven people who elected the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the German nation. So when Frederick spoke, people listen. Now, Tetzel went to Jutteburg and Zerbst, which are outside of, of Saxony. And that's where these indulgences were served. And this was Tetzel's preaching, you know, forgiveness of sins, remission of guilt. And Luther said, nope, that's not where this is. He has a doctorate in theology. His position is to call the church back. So when he created these, he said, you know, and there's the famous expression, as soon, you know, that's the famous expression that was that was coined by Tetzel. Um, I have to move this screen over there. As soon as the coin into the box rings, a soul from purgatory to heaven springs. And this upset Luther. And so here we are. So his personal piety, his monasticism, his encounter with scholastic which was not good, his mysticism, um, you know, the humanist methods, um, all of these things were a part of his, his patristics and humanist methods were a part of his upbringing. And this prompted him then to post 95 theses. These are the 95 theses on the restored door where they, we believe he posted them. And there he is with his hammer posting his theses. The theses were, print, were written in Latin because he wanted an academic debate. And this is a 17th century presentation of the posting of the theses, which I find exceeding that we have in a book in the rare book room. And you can see him writing his theses on the door of the church. And he has this long quill pen. And it's amazing because this long quill pen reaches back and back and it eventually knocks off the tiara of the Pope. And so this was, this was how the theses worked. He didn't see it that way. He saw that I'm just going to have an academic debate and we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about indulgences. So he was condemned as a heretic by Priarius and he had a, a trial with the church in Augsburg with Cardinal Cayetan and then in Leipzig with Eck. And they both supported the position of Priarius that he was a heretic. So as Luther is wrestling with this issue that he realized beat was very important, he had no idea. And last week I laid on a lot of theology to you. I laid out a lot of theology and I, I know that it's difficult, but as we understand Luther at this point in our study, somewhere in 1518, he came to see the righteousness of God. This was the thing that scared him. If you read his his lectures on Psalms and all that, he always talked about justification, mercy, promise, and love, but he hadn't pulled all the pieces of the puzzle together. The missing piece was the righteousness of God. And so between the spring and fall of 1518, Luther comes to this understanding. The righteousness of God scared him. And when he was at the at, at table celebrating mass, he was afraid because he's standing in front of the Holy One and he's a sinner, and he has no mediator. And so this, the righteousness of God always sent him into panic attacks. And then he realizes that the righteousness of God, which he's talking about, which he's been talking about, justitia Dei, is actually a gift that God has given to us, is given to us as gift, that righteousness. It's not the goal of my life. It's the foundation of my life. Not my goal, but my foundation. And so this is a gift. And once that piece falls into place, then everything else, everything else becomes together. Justification, mercy, grace, forgiveness, it all comes together. It's all gift. And as he said, the doors of paradise opened to him. And he realized he didn't need to be afraid of God. He didn't need to be afraid to stand in the presence of the Holy One. And that's a major shift. And that's the joy of being Lutheran and what we say. Um, I know where I'm headed. I know when that, that last moment comes and I breathe my last, I know my next breath is in the arms of my Savior. Everything else, I don't, under, I don't know what heaven looks like. I don't need to know that. I know who I'm with. 
it's like my dog Lucy. I open the door, she's happy I'm there. The rest is the rest is inconsequential. We're together. So the printing press helps Luther, helps Luther. It gives him a means of spreading this. And this is Froben. Oh, this is Petri, uh, 1517. He's publishing the, the 95 theses in Latin. And I love this because <laughs> If you look at the, the numbering, they do they do to 25 and they start one over again. They can only get up to 25. He's got 95. So they're going to have three sets, three sets of 25, right? So three sets of 25 and then one of 20 as they number them. So it's just as a librarian, as a person who really works with the history of books and reading, it's like, oh, so you had to know which 20, which 23 what, which one, which set? I just love this sort of thing, but it was printed out in Latin so that everybody else could read and join in. And this is the copy we have in the rare book room. And when I handle this book, I realized this is a treasure. Luther went viral. 600 people across the European continent started to get to know what Luther was talking about. And it was released in October of 1518. And when I opened this, I went, whoa, this is impressive. I'm holding this in my hand. And this was held by, I don't know how many unknown readers who began to hear Luther. This is how most of Europe met Luther in books, in publications. And so, you know, he sells, and we talked about this when Luther went viral, how this book was sold across Europe and how he printed 600 copies and sent them, France, Spain, the Low Countries, England, and every word was getting out. And so it's a wonderful moment as Luther's word starts to spread across continental Europe into places and people begin to read him in Latin. That's what the educated people would have done. They read it and they, learned, they heard his voice. So this is Luther at work. This is the writ of excommunication. Leo, Leo the, the 10th excommunicates, final, excommunicates Luther in 1520 and it was written and sent to him, but this is a printed copy. This is one of the early printed copies that we have in the rare book room. And this is Leo X uh, judging Luther. And you see Leo in the little icon there in the little illumination there on the left-hand side. And it says, arise, O Lord, and judge your own cause. Remember your reproaches to those who are filled with foolishness all through the day. Listen to our prayers. For foxes have arisen seeking to destroy the vineyard whose winepress you alone have trod. And it continues and continues, but it's the yellow at the bottom of that opening page, which I've highlighted in yellow. The wild boar from the forests seeks to destroy it, and every wild beast feeds upon it. So the Pope is calling Luther a wild boar. And that would make sense because Luther, uh, the Pope wrote this when he was at one of his hunting lodges and having, you know, he was out there hunting. So this is what it looks like. This is what the, the document of excommunication looks like when it was printed at that time. And we have a, a copy of it. So the papal bull is dated uh, June 15th, 1520. It's published on July 24th, 1520. And Luther will receive it in December 10th. And so he, it's over with. So this is how it is. So when word finally reaches Wittenberg that it's official, it's all over, what does Luther do? Well, he walks down to this oak tree, um, this oak tree, and he burns it. Um, he burns the writ of excommunication and a few other things. And he went back to, to the monastery. A few of the students were, were having too much beer, I guess, that night, and they were throwing other things on the fire. And eventually the constables and magistrates had to move them on. <laughs> You know what it's like. So this is it. And if you go to, to Wittenberg, this is the place where we believe Luther took it. Uh, Luther took it just outside the city gates. There was a hospital nearby and the fire was burning because they were burning the clothes of those who had died. And so there was a fire always burning there. And that's where he took it and, and put it on the, on the fire to burn it. So now, if you go into St. Mary's Church, which I showed you the picture of St. Mary's Church, where he is, this is the altar that was installed in 1547. And if you sit in this church, I, and I ask that you would have a few moments to just sit and look at this altar. It, is, it was done by um, Kranach the Younger. And I'm going to take you to the, the base of this altar, because this is where it gets fun to to be a Lutheran and to be, to be, to be who we are, and to see how 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 wonderful our ancestors were. So here's the altar. 
piece behind the, the freestanding altar there. And you get to this moment. This is the base that's holding up this altar. And of course, you see on the right hand side, Luther preaching. And you see on the left hand side, people listening to the preaching. And what is he talking about? It's the heart of the gospel. Jesus, the Christ crucified, dying for us. This is Cranach. This is the house of Cranach, the elder and the junior. The loincloth of Jesus, when a Cranach paints the crucified Christ, will always be fluttering. It's this moment that even in this moment of supreme of death, God is alive and God is God is God is there and doing. And God dies on that day. That's the moment. I know it's a hard concept for us to wrap our heads around because we always think God is eternal, but God loves us so much that God will die on that day to consume death. And as I've often said, if God can't die, then God ain't God. So process that little sentence that I just said, if God can't die, then God can't, then God ain't God. If there's something that is more superior than God, then God isn't God. And out of love, God consumes death so that we, we, come out on the other side, the victors, and that's, that's Luther preaching that. His, his left hand is on the scriptures, which he's preaching from, and his right hand is pointing to the crucified Christ. So I just went and talked to you about his excommunication document. Arise, a wild boar has come out of the forest. Well, if you look at the pulpit, what Cranach has done, and I don't have a really clear resolution there, it's a boar. So in 1547, when this altar was erected, Luther is dead one year, his parishioners see their beloved pastor, and there at the pulpit is the boar. And that boar is there because it points back to 1520, when he was officially excommunicated, and the Pope said, arise, because a wild boar has come from the forest and is devouring. And so there's this moment of humor, this moment of humor, you know, so be it, so, so it is. And we, we live through all of these moments and the wild boar and Cranach had a sense of humor. And on this night, I just would like to say, here's a moment of a treaty, a treat. You know, if you get to Wittenberg and you sit in St. Mary's, look at that painting, it preaches, images preach. So, you know, and then we, we walk through, he was excommunicated and then he has to head, head to the diet the parliament with Charles V. And there's this stunning moment. This is Anton von Werner, uh, a 19th century German artist painting. And Luther's just standing there pointing to his writings and saying, unless you show me I'm wrong, I can't, I can't go against my conscience. You know, so there it is. May God help me. Amen. And some believe he also said, here I stand, I will not be moved. And this is a moment. This is a, an important moment in our history and who we are that we said, okay, you can kick us out of the Roman Catholic Church, but you can't kick the church Catholic out of us. We're, this is us. So, and this is at Washington Memorial Chapel. Um, Roy Olmquist and I were served there for, for a number of years. And, and this is, the, clo this is the, the Hamilton window named after Alexander Hamilton. It's to the, if I'm standing in the pulpit, it's to my right. This is the panel that is closest to the pulpit and it was always when I stood there, it's like, I'm serving in the Episcopal Church right now in this parish, thanks to call to common mission, but I am here standing here in the pulpit, and Luther's right next to me, and it's this moment of, yes, we are, we are in this together. There is the famous moment of Luther raising his hand uh, with his, his right hand is on the books, and his left hand is raised, and he's, stand, he's standing before the emperor. And if you're ever in any doubt as who's who, just look at the hats. You just got to look at the hats. And the person with the hat and is seated, that's the emperor. And Luther doesn't have a hat. He's the monk. So it was always this wonderful moment. And I would always look at these, this wonderful this panel in the Hamilton window as I would be preaching or getting ready to preach and thinking, hey, Luther, you know, we're in this together. Let's preach the word. Let's give the good news. You know, let's, let's rejoice. So, and these are some, you know, Luther's drawing on his church tradition, the church fathers, reason, scripture. He's pulling this all together. These are sources of authority for him, you know, as we, we come together to be the people of God. And I talked about his first sabbatical. After the Diet of Worms, he had to be hidden. And he ended up in the Wartburg, which is on a high hill, mountain, in Eisenach, where he went to school and where Johann Sebastian Bach was born. 
If you get there and they say, let's go to the bar port, take the bus, take the bus. Here's where he was. This is the place where he lived. And here he is. He's now Junker Jorg. He had to grow his hair. He had to grow a beard, live in disguise. There he is, Sir, Sir George, Sir George. This is the room where he worked and he translated these, the scriptures into German. He's number 19. Please remember that he's number 19. But he was number one in the sense that he translated it from the Greek. And this is the copy of, we have this in the rare book from the 1519. This is the copy of Erasmus's, his second edition of the New Testament where he's working. And this is what Luther has with him as he's beginning to work with the text and he's reading the Greek. He can read Greek. He will translate the New Testament in 11 weeks. It would take me 11 years probably to get it all down, but he did it in 11 weeks. And so here's the 1519. And on the right hand side, you see the Latin and you see in principio erat sermo. In the beginning was the sermon. This was Erasmus's attempt to wake us up to what this means. In the beginning was the verb. God is action. God sees, God hears. That's the gospel. So this is what Luther has in hand. And this is the 1523 that we have in the rare book room that was released. And then I showed you his translation schedule. He was interrupted many times and he finally finished it all up about 11 years later. And so I give thanks. I give thanks for his, his perseverance. These are the diets which he would, that were being held at the time. And these are important. The mm -hmm. ones in yellow are the ones in, that are important. And this is where you, the cities where they met. And they were often, where you met was determined by where was the plague. And they met in places where there was no plague. And so 1526 is the famous Ferdinand, Charles's brother was there. And Ferdinand said, okay, your region, your religion, you make the decision. Charles didn't like it. And he dismissed it. It was dismissed in 1529. And then he wrote the pro protest. Okay. Um, this is the, the election of the emperor, which we talked about briefly, and Charles is there in 1529, and he reverses the decision of 1526 and says, no, we're going back to the Edict of Worms, the Diet of Worms. It is, it is you're going to follow this, and then they follow, they follow. You see where he's present, where he's absent. Um, so he's on German territory in 1529, but I don't believe he's at the Diet, but he is present in 1530. So it's, it's a number of chess pieces, as I've talked to you before. There's a number of chess pieces moving across the board. Here's his brother. He is, he is the king of the Germans. And so, as I said, this is a chess board, and there are a number of pieces. The emperor, the electors, um, the Ottoman Turks, Francis I in France, you know, these are pieces that are moving around. And so there's always this, you're working together to create a program that will help you advance the cause. But as I said, history is never neat and Charles has to compromise. So, you know, here we are. Charles is not a, is a German. He's a, he's a non-German. He's an outsider. He has to deal with France. He has to deal with the papacy and Turkish invasion. So he's always, he has to work. He, he's not the all-powerful emperor. So it's an international arena. And here's his lifelong rival, Francis I, you know, and when you look at the Holy Roman Empire, the German nation, it surrounded France. And of course, they're going to push. They're going to push. And the Ottoman Turks, all that is blue is now in the hands of the Ottomans. And they're getting closer and closer. In 1529, they're knocking on the doors of Vienna. And Charles V has to come to terms in order to get an army. So these are the cities as they're moving, they're moving through Southeast Europe. And this was, this was a threat. This was a major threat to them. And war was imminent, and it will occur. So we have the Catholic Alliance. We have the evangelicals coming together. And here are the two, John the Steadfast, Philip of Hess. These are the people who side on the evangelical side, the evangelical presentation, and back Luther. And John the Steadfast will, hold, will be steadfast. He will, he will hold to it, and he will back. And then the Diet of Spire, we talked about this. It was your region your religion. And then we said in 19, 1529, that was reversed. And Archduke said, no, we can't do this. And then there was the protest. The protest was what he has in his hand. That's all it was. We were not thrown out. We were not dismissed. They filed their legal right to appeal. We are going to continue this conversation.
And so all of these, the designers of the, the Speyer protest are five princes, not two, five, and 14 imperial cities. So as I've said all along, you know, at Worms, Charles V dealt with one recalcitrant monk. When he gets to, to Augsburg, when he gets to, when in 1529, it's a coalition. So now we're going to close this session on Luther with this little moment, this devotional moment of what I've learned from, from Luther. We're headed to the Diet of Augsburg, where, where Charles V wants to hear Luther. He wants to hear him, and he will make the decision. But as you know, he needs to, he's been victorious in Italy. He has peace with the Pope. The Turks have withdrawn from the gates of Vienna, but he needs a coalition. He needs to work on this. So let's sit down, see if we can strike something up. Let's sit down. I will give the evangelicals a chance to, to give their position. So we received the summons on 1511. In, 15, in March 15, uh, received the summons issued on, yes, uh, on March 11th, Charles V will release the summons. We are going to talk about religion at Augsburg. He writes it out on January 21st. It takes a, a while to get there. The world moves at three miles an hour. So on March 11th, they hear we're getting to Augsburg and it will be in June. So they have to move. Now, Luther cannot attend Augsburg because it's outside of Saxony. So he has to stay in Castle Coburg. And we talked about this. But this is how I would like to wrap up Luther for Lutherans. What does Luther do? This is an anxiety, anxiety provoking moment. This is the castle. This is the castle. So what happens here? As I said last week, Luther arrives in the evening under secret. It was he arrived. He, nobody knew he was there. Well, a lot of people did, but it was kept secret. This is where he's going to spend his second sabbatical. And so here he is. So Luther can't sleep. He's away from. He's away from. Um, he's away from the family and is faced with a major moment. He stood before the emperor in Worms in 1521 and cannot do it now. Everything he has worked for is on the line and he is invested. And I like to think when I read that, when I started to contemplate what he's going through in Coburg, I thought I can identify with that. You know, I've invested my life. My, my, I, my, my safety has been invested in this moment. And I talked to the emperor right up front in 1521 in Worms. I can't do it now. And so it's anxiety provoking. So what does he do? Well, he was given two rooms um, in what we would call the Hoa Kemenate, which is the high lady's bower. So he's given two very special rooms in Castle Coburg where he can reside. Okay, so here it is, Lutherans. What do we do when we're in a position of anxiety? And what do we do? So what does Luther do? Well, he had to, he let his beard grow so that he would remain incognito. And I love this. I love this. He started wearing glasses for reading and writing. He's 47. So as I look out on my audience this evening, I see a lot of us are wearing glasses. So Luther is along with, yes, there we are. I, I got mine when I was 12 years old. So <laughs> I started early. So I always love that moment. Luther's wearing glasses and it's like, okay, Luther, you know what it's like to start aging. Okay, so there it is. So this is what he might have looked like as he had to grow his beard again and be incognito and wearing glasses. So what does he do? Well, as I pointed out last week, his luggage didn't arrive. So not only is he invested and upset that he can't be in Worms, his luggage, all of the things he's bringing, hasn't arrived yet. And there are many of us who have arrived at an airplane terminal and discovered our, well, our, we went to Philadelphia and our luggage ended up somewhere else and we have to wait a day or two to get it. Okay, so, so the life anxieties, even though the world's moving at three miles an hour, there's still little mess ups. So what does he do? So here's people have got something I read as I read what he was doing. He had verses from the Psalms painted on the walls. Now, granted, he, <laughs> he didn't put them in English. This is what I found on the internet. And I thought this is, and he didn't have that furniture. But I thought this is, this is interesting. What does Luther do? He puts scripture verses on the wall. You know, he wants to be surrounded by these words because he's anxious. And so what do we do? What, are one, what, are, what is one way that we can handle anxiety as Lutherans? Go to the scriptures. Open the book. Let the words overflow. So he has these words painted on the wall for him to receive comfort. 
No, this is the word, sorry. I'm trying to move this little pesky screen. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Psalm 118. We think this is the, this, the psalm he is retranslating and working. Um, when Luther had moments alone, he loved to translate and retranslate because he's never satisfied like nobody who translates. There's a better word. I, I know it's there. I just need to think about it. And Psalm 118, we think, is one of his favorite psalms. You know, Danke dem Herrn, der Neres Fronti, von seine Güte wäre ewig. Thank the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And this was one of his favorite psalms. And then, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let not the downtrodden be put to shame. Let the poor and needy praise, praise thy name. So he's surrounding himself. He's surrounding himself with Bible verses because this is where he encounters the living God. This is what gives him the comfort. So that's what he does. He hung the picture of his one-year-old daughter, Magdalena, the Katie had sent him. So what does that say? He remembers his family. So people of God, as we work on this uh, Luther for Lutherans, um, when we get into these anxiety-provoking provoke, moments, here's what Luther did. And so I pass this on in our closing moments of these sessions to say, hi, this is what I learned. Open the Bible, start reading the verses, recount your, you know, memorize, do it. And then he remembered his family, the gifts of God that had been given to him. And this is his daughter. He will lose her. He will lose her when she's about seven years old and he's heartbroken. And so, but at this moment, um, his wife, Katie, sent a picture along and said, take this with you. And so he has that he surrounds himself with Bible verses that are important to him, where he meets and encounters the Almighty on friendly terms. And then he has his family there. Ah, ah here's another moment. What can I pass on to you from our, our mentor in, in anxiety provoking moments? He notices the jackdaws, they're cousins to ravens and crows. These he's in this high place. These castles were placed on high hills and they overlooked the territory. They were they were outlook posts, so they're high up there. And he notices these birds. So he starts reminiscing. And he says he starts writing a piece called the, the Diet of the Jackdaws, as opposed to the Diet of Augsburg. The Diet of the Jackdaws, the kings, nobles, and princes who were proclaiming their decrees endlessly because they crow at one another, they talk to one another, and they, they, they chatter. They did not meet in the mere palace. Their magnificent place had heaven for its roof, the tall trees for its floors, and the ends of the world for its walls. The participants scorned the luxury of gold and silk. Rather, they were all dressed alike in splendid black and had the same gray eyes, all the same music, their only distinction being their different voices of the old and young. So he, he starts embarking. What is he doing here? He's introducing some humor. He's joking. He's trying to, he knows he's powerless, but he starts to ease the tension by, by just joking by just joking and, and mocking these birds basically and listening to their diet and, and comparing it to the diet of the emperor and all of the, the powers that be and you know and there they are but they don't go to a palace they go to the heavens they go to the heavens as their roof and the trees are their foot and so he has this humor so he has the bible he has a picture of his family and he has humor that is accompanying him and he's he's learning to exhale Ah, this is his wife, Katharina from Bora, an ex-nun, and she's the one that marries him. So confined to the fortress, in Fortress Coburg, for 165 days, he consumed wine. He and his friends and guests consumed 1,200 liters of wine, and Katie reprimanded him. Uh, he would later develop a toothache and a sore throat. So she sort of felt comforted by the fact that saying, uh, nah, Luther, uh, stop that. What? You know, so this is interesting. This is, this, is, this, is, this is Luther dealing with these things and dealing with it. So, but what is important here is that he had relaxation. And I'm going to get to one more thing. So he has his, his Bible with him, picture of the family. He's relaxing. He has some humor. And he's, he's, you know, he relaxes with, with a glass that's going to get a comfort, a cup of tea, something that's going to bring him joy in this moment. Okay, so there it is. And then he has this, Argela von Grumbach. Argela von Grumbach is a Hohenstaufen uh, Baroness. 
She is money, money poor, but land rich, and she has position. She was a good friend of Luther, and she defended Lutheranism in Bavaria. Um, so what he does here, she comes and she stays with him in Castle Coburg. And I guarantee you, when she walked in the room, he stood up because uh, she is a Hohenstaufen Baroness. And uh, she was giving Luther pointers on how Katie was, was had a child and they were trying to wean the child and she was giving him some advice. So he had friends with him. Um, apparently when they drink 1200 liters of wine, you know, you need, they're doing it with friends, but he has friends with him and that's important. And this is, this is the, this is Argola from Grumbach. Um, an assistant professor was dismissed from the Ingolstadt University for being Lutheran. And she challenged the university administration in pamphlets. We have all of her pamphlets in the rare book room at uh, the seminary on Germantown Avenue. I created a display of them. This is where she's arguing with them saying, you show me where Luther is wrong. And she called them to a public debate. It never happened, but it did happen. These pamphlets were printed. And so that was what Luther, Luther was doing. And Luther was talking to friends and this was a supporter. She was one of his, his supporters in, in Bavaria and she argued his case. And then as he, he did his exposition, we think that this was written between the 13th and 26th of June. When he had time, he exegeted the scriptures, the beautiful, the beautiful exposition on Psalm 118. This is where he did it. He had some time on his hands. So he's reading the Bible. He's a picture of his, he has Bible verses placed on walls around him. Uh, they had to paint it because they didn't have the little postcards that you could put up when you got, you know, they didn't have, they weren't there yet. So he has the, painted, the words painted on the wall. And then he has a picture of his family. He relaxes. Uh, he relaxes. He has a sense of humor. The Jack Dolls are the, the, the new parliament and they're talking among themselves. He has friends, he's staying in touch with them. And then he spends some time where he's doing what makes him happy. He's writing, he's writing and he's ex exegeting the scriptures. What does this verse mean to me and how can I translate it? So he's keeping busy by doing what he loves. We don't have a systematic theology from Luther. Calvin will give us a systematic theology, the Institutes of Christian Religion. Luther never does that because it's not his interest. He's not interested in systematizing God. And this is an important point, people of God. We Lutherans don't know the mind of God. We will never, we, we confess, I do not know the mind of God. Okay, but I see the handiwork of God. I see the hand of God at work, but I don't know the mind of God. And so we are always, we, we come back to our humility and say, I don't know. So there are certain places, predestination bothered Lutherans later. And then eventually they said, well, it's obvious, the word is there in the scriptures and obviously as something is happening, but we just can't fathom it. So we give thanks that God is obviously worrying about us and okay, and we move on. And there are places where we just say, we move on. I don't know, I don't know the mind of God. So, so those are important lessons. And the emperor will be the last to arrive on June 15th. He needs to make the grand entrance. And we saw this picture last week where we're in the hall, where we're listening, we see the emperors and his brother, King Ferdinand, and they're reading, they're reading the Augsburg Confession in German because that window is open. Nobody else was allowed except the delegates, but they were all standing in the courtyard and they could hear it. And so this is the moment. So my point in this, this final session was to give something practical um, that I've put together as I read what Luther was doing when he was in Castle Coburg. And I'm gonna stop the share. Um, and this is how I wished to end it. Hi, Jean, good evening. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, great to see you. And so this was my, the way I wished to wrap this up as, to, as opposed to being very heady, but seeing what Luther taught me and putting this together, because I know we all face anxiety in provoking moments. And what did Luther do? This is how Luther handled it. And I found that practical, put it in my toolkit and said, the next time you have those moments, here's some things, ways to handle it. So people of God, I'm going to stop the recording right now so that we can just chat for a few